There are more steam engines to be seen now on British rail lines than there have been for 20 years. Of them all, I think the most romantic is the Duchess of Hamilton. And of all the lines in England still open, the toughest must be the Settle to Carlisle Railway. so well known is that 30 years ago I was the proud owner of the Duchess of Hamilton. She was nine inches long, weighed well over a pound and kept falling off at the corners. Now at last I've come face to face with the real Duchess who weighs over a hundred tons in her stocking feet and pulls 500 tons with a full train. It was worth waiting for. The Duchess lives at York in the National Railway Museum, but she sallies forth regularly to haul special trains over long distances. And for this she has to be prepared and fired up the day before by Pete the fireman and Kim the engineer. Prepared with extra care if you're climbing the Settle Carlisle line. I spent five years of my youth sitting beside a railway line collecting train numbers, hardly ever going home. It's what they call a misspent youth. I shouldn't have been collecting numbers. I should have been finding out how engines actually work. Well, it's never too late to learn. First thing we do is make sure that the, the boiler has actually got water in it. You know, so it hasn't, you would, you would do quite yeah. a lot of damage if, <laughs> if it hadn't. Well, I think it's about time we lit it now. The boiler is all right. We've got plenty of water in. We'll get right. the up to light it. Right. right. They're quite fussy about the kind of coal they use. Welsh coal's not bad, but Yorkshire's good, and Nottinghamshire is quite good too. During the miners' strike, they found themselves using Polish coal. They didn't like it much. How long does the coal take to light? Does it, does it take fire immediately? Three or four minutes. The coal is actually burning. It's better than my fire, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We've previously coaled the firebox. Yeah. Fill the firebox full of coal first. You've got all the coal you need? Nearly all You don't start off with a little bit and then build up? No, no. About six inch cover. What's the fullest it ever gets? Is that about it? No, when the engine's working you can have probably about three quarters of a ton in there. It takes about six hours to get the boiler into steam from coal. So, really, Kim, we're, we're sitting under a huge boiler which is mounted on huge wheels. What I want to know is how does the steam get to the wheel? Well, the boiler, which is all that red mass, is full of water. And at the top, there's what we call the dome. And in there, there's the regulator valve or throttle valve. The steam then comes from that regulator valve through into the, the smoke box, which is this black mass at the front here. And that's then what we call superheated, which is uh, the steam is then taken in tubes back through the fire tubes and heated even more to a higher temperature. This, this engine, when that's working hard, can get up to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Yeah. Oh, and then that came from the superheater and it comes down to the, the cylinders. And this particular locomotive's got four cylinders. There's uh, one on either side and, and two, two, hidden. two hidden between the frames. Uh, this, this part here is the valve that uh, lets the steam 
be admitted to one or the other side of the piston mm -hmm. because th this is this is a double actin engine, not like a car engine. That's double actin. The piston is actually pulled and pushed, and this valve up here controls which side of the piston that that steam is so going. All, all the power is in there. The power is all in the cylinders, yes. And just that That's little cylinder pushes this thing. Well, this and three other cylinders, yeah. It's then transmitted through this crosshead because that piston wouldn't be strong. It would bend if it hadn't got support from these bars and then down oh, to the connecting rod into a rotary motion down onto the crank, which is incorporated in the wheel. This is one that's actually driven by the uh, cylinders. The other one is the leading one. And that's one driven in by the inside That's it? driven by the inside cylinders. See, and that's connected along? That's connected by a side rod, which connects all six driving wheels together so that you've got better adhesion. And it really makes a difference? That makes a lot of difference, yeah. If you had a single wheel, you wouldn't get half the... Before the war, the London Midland Scottish Railway was lagging badly behind the other lines. There's nothing nearly as powerful on their express routes as the Great Western Kings, so they tempted William Stanier, the wizard designer of the Great Western, to come over to them and create something fast and sleek. By 1938, he had come up with the goods, the Princess and Duchess classes. And it was in that year that the Duchess of Hamilton was born at Crewe. All manner of smaller parts are made in the smithy. Nuts and bolts in all sizes and varieties. Rivets for the tens of thousands. This is where the mysteries go in. A modern engine, such as 6207, has a big appetite for steam. Hence her large great area of 45 square feet and her high amount of tubing. First to go in is the main steam pipe, through the center of which will later go the rod connecting the regulator handle to the valve. Meanwhile, things have been happening at the other end of the boiler, and some familiar objects have been finding their way onto the fire door plate. One of the most amazing sights is the way heavy loads, and mostly awkward and cumbersome ones, are slung about in the work. A screech from the overhead crane, grappling hooks descending out of the air en route, and almost before you can say knife, a load of from 50 tons up to a complete engine is whisked away to a new position. She's off. A thousand men have served her in the making. How many thousands will she serve during her life on the LMS main line? Is this what they call a Pacific class? That's right, yeah. And that's it's something to do with the wheels, isn't it? I never um, yeah, so you've got four carrying wheels at the front, then you've big six driving wheels, and then two little carrying wheels. So it's not back. a Duchess class, or it is a Duchess class as well? Well, the proper term for on the LMS called them Princess Coronations. What do you call them? Duchesses. <laughs> <laughs> and did it look like this when it was first built? Oh, no, no. It had a streamlined case on it. What do they do then? How to cut the wind resistance down, so I was, in theory you burnt less coal. They seem to have gone through a fashion for streamlining in the 30s, and then they stopped doing it, so it couldn't, it couldn't have been that effective. Well, it was very difficult to keep the engine in good maintenance when you've got to get behind the uh, casing every time to do daily jobs. Just before the war, there really was a mania for speed for being the fastest steam engine on earth or for winning the transatlantic blue ribbon and things were made to look that way as well with the streamlining stripes even going down the carriages maybe it somehow helped to counteract the depression of the 1930s oddly enough the streamlined look is back with us again today on british rails intercity trains no sooner was a duchess built than she was sent to america to appear at the new york world's fair the Americans had heard all about the Crack Express from London to Scotland, the Coronation Scot, and the Coronation engine was what they wanted. What they got was the Duchess. They changed the name plates and the number. Isn't that what we call cheating? Well, yes, but that was done quite a bit with uh, locos. 
to meet uh, well American regulations, so uh, that had to be fitted with a headlight. Plus, they put a bell on it. Was that just for fun, or you don't have no, to have no, a bell? No, no, that, that was their regulation. Really? Yeah. Shipping the Coronation Scott engine at Southampton is quite a job, for it weighs a hundred tons. Driver Bishop and Fireman Carswell are there to see it put aboard. As the locomotive is lifted from the quayside by the ship's derrick, the vessel takes a heavy list, but rights herself again as it's swung over the hull. The ship that takes it across, by the way, is Norwegian. The train is going to America to tour the country and to be on show at the World's Fair. A month before the fair ended, the Second World War broke out and the Duchess was stuck in America. And there she stayed, being seen by an amazing three million visitors, until 1942, when the LMS decided to risk bringing her back on a midwinter transatlantic convoy. And luckily, she arrived safe and sound in Cardiff that February. They needed it for the war effort, you know, that was difficult. They hadn't really got enough locos to keep all the traffic moving the war traffic, so everything that they could find was more or less put into traffic. I always imagine that trains were sort of restricted during the war. Oh People no, yeah, yeah, yeah. enormous uh, movements of materials and troops during the war. From the ports, trains took the battle-weary men to the dispersal points. At the shortest possible notice, special trains were hurriedly assembled, and in the space of eight days, 620 specials were run from seven ports in the southeast of England. So the war was good for the railways, then. Really well, <laughs> good, yeah, good business. Yeah, that, yeah right? that nearly wore the railways out, actually. <laughs> well, what happened when steam started being phased out and diesel came in? Well, they gradually got displaced. They were put onto um, empty coach and stock trains and freight trains just to finish up their useful life. And then when they died, they, they died. That's right. In yeah. the scrapyard. Yeah. Well, how come duchesses survived then? Well, that was just um, luck more than anything. Um, Mr. Butland decided he would like some attractions at uh, certain holiday camps. And uh, this was one that was bought, along with uh, Duchess of Sutherland. Well, where did this one go? Mine it. <laughs> After quite a bit of time. Somebody asked why are they in there and do Butland still want them? Wouldn't it be nice to have them in a museum? And uh, um, after a period of uh, a few years that, that was agreed that Butland's would uh, then release them. So it actually still belongs to Butland's then? This they still could belongs get it back to anytime they wanted. Yeah. It's on loan. So any day they could take it back to the holiday camp? Well, they? in theory, yes. <laughs> yeah. How much did it cost to put this together again when, when all the, the operations have been done on the on the abdomen and the guts? Around about £40,000. £40,000? Mm. And how much did it cost to build in the first place? Well, 11300 <laughs> That's to build? That's inflation. <laughs> what I'd never realised was just how full of steam a steam engine really is. Smoke may come out of the chimney, but everything else is steam, with no electricity to help at all. If you want sand on the line to help the wheels grip, you blow it out by steam. If you want more water in the boiler, you blow it in by steam. The Duchess has steam pipes the way we have blood vessels. Cut her, she bleeds steam. Well, I think I understand how it all works now. Except for one thing, how do you, how do you actually start it? Right, well, we'll show you, because we're now going to move off the shed in any case, so... <coughs> you have to turn this handle on, that creates a brake. So as you can get the brakes off. The first thing you, you have to make sure of, you can stop before you move. <laughs> but, uh, that's got to come around 21 inches for mercury. Okay. We test it. We then take the engine tender handbrake off. Then 
we move this lever to whichever direction we want to go, in this case backwards. And pull this lever and that will move. Magic, so it does. So, have you got anything more to do before the run tomorrow? No, we're all ready for tomorrow now. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, because we need time to get off. Yeah. Right, bye. If anyone can be called a Duchess's best friend, it's Kim, who accompanies her everywhere with an oily rag, like a butler with a napkin. On the great day itself, Kim isn't actually allowed to drive the engine on a British rail line. Only full-time British rail drivers can do that. Not that there are many people left in British rail who still know how. And it may be that one day we'll have lots of steam engines and no steam drivers. One thing we'll never run out of, though, is steam train enthusiasts. And for today's heavyweight contest between the Duchess of Hamilton and the settled Carlisle Railway, every seat has been booked in advance by enthusiasts, nostalgics, connoisseurs and experts. One of them is local historian and non-stop enthusiast Colin Speakman. This is settled in the beginning of the line, really. That's right. It was known as the Long Drag, of course, because the, um, the climb starts here and there's something like 20-odd miles of continuous climb, a tremendous amount of work for locomotive men and their, their crews. Especially the steam engine. That's right, in the steam engine. Yeah. A little easier with diesel, obviously. The reason the line is here is nothing to do with the desire of people in Settle to have a day out in Carlisle, or even vice versa. It's because the Midland Railway were desperate to get their own express main line to Scotland, and the only way they could drive it was over the mountains. Progress was so hard that they even petitioned Parliament to be allowed to give it up. Parliament refused permission, so the Midland spent five long, horrible, dirty, cold years completing the line. And the worst bit, for the builders then, and the engine now, is the 15-mile long drag to the summit. Nobody knows quite how powerful the Duchess is, because they've never been able to shovel coal in fast enough to get her up to full power. It's not the train which reaches 100% output, it's the fireman. Even two firemen wouldn't be enough. The line was built by thousands of Irish navvies living in townships rather like gold rush towns, with their own shops, chapels, even tramways. It's odd to think that the Romans were here for hundreds of years and left hardly anything behind except Hadrian's Wall. The Irish were here for just five and left great monuments behind, bridges, tunnels, viaducts. The greatest of all is the Ribblehead Viaduct, now crumbling so much that passage across it is restricted to one line in the middle. The rise and fall of the Irish Empire, indeed. People keep talking about Ribblehead Viaduct as if it was the, the big one. Is there something special about it? Well, again, it's a, a long and very colourful history. Initially, of course, they simply wanted to fill in Batty Moss Bog and r run it across the top. But they found it was quite impossible, so they hit upon a really rather brilliant engineering solution to build this enormous viaduct out of local sandstone and, and uh, limestone. But inevitably, it's now suffering from wear and tear. It lasted well over a century but it's going to be a major problem to maintain, and it could, in fact, be the great question mark over the future of this railway. You mean the whole line could exist, but there'll be a little gap in the middle? That's right. There's talk of stopping the trains at one end of the viaduct and, you know, making people walk to the far end and continuing on the next train. Uh, we hope it won't happen.
So this is the, the dreaded Bleemore Tunnel. Yes, yeah, a dreadful, nasty hole, something like two and a half thousand uh, feet long, 500 feet underground, and a place that was very difficult to build. A lot of lives lost, a lot of expense. And rail women, I think, have always hated it, particularly in the days of steam trains. So it was a very nasty place to go through. Yeah, I've never met anyone who liked it at all. Well, a typical line. Do you ever get good days to go up here? Well, we sometimes talk about settled Carlisle weather. That's the kind of days where the, the rain comes sideways. But at the same time, it can change remarkably quickly and um, be incredibly beautiful in a matter of moments. Very near the summit now. Something like 1,100 feet above sea level. That's high. We're at Dent Head, coming up to Dent Station, which in fact is the highest station on any railway line in uh, certainly in England and Wales. No idea, nowhere near Dent as far as uh, I can make out. Four and a half miles away, so it was quite a long walk when you arrived at Dent to walk between the station and the town. People have often asked the old story, you know, why was the station there? Uh, because the railway line went there. What are those strange pillar-like things up there? Uh, snow fences. One of the problems in this line, of course, is that um, the weather can create tremendous difficulties. Uh, there are stories of trains disappearing in under snowdrifts for something like three or four days before they can finally dig them out. This stop is Garsdale, but it's the same thing every stop. All the experts leave their seats and come rushing forward to photograph the engine and peer at its workings. They remind me rather of a squad of medical men, making sure the Duchess doesn't have the slightest cough or splutter, even though she's smoking so much. The surgeons themselves are dressed in orange operating jackets. These are the super enthusiasts who handle the coal and the water and, of course, the crowds. Try and go behind Can you cross behind the photographers, please? please, ladies and gentlemen, then you won't be in the way. get the impression, going through this beautiful but desolate countryside, that the builders of the line had only one place in mind, far away Glasgow. What I wanted to know was how much the people who lived here got from the new railway. Quite a lot. Um, local farming, for example, benefited. Um, the dairy industry it became possible to get your milk um, collected and taken to the nearest railway station, for example, Appleby. Um, and taken even on overnight trains to London. Express dairies, um, Edenvale dairies, uh, all developed dairy farming in, in the region. Is that where the yoghurt comes from? Originally, it gave a great stimulus to, to, to the local economy. Of course, we're not the only film crew out today. Almost everyone on the train seems to be producing and directing and shooting their own film. And at Appleby Station, the Duchess responds by putting on a special show for the cameras, as well as full sound effects for the microphones. Closing the Settle Carlisle line could do serious damage to the Japanese photographic industry, not to mention wipe out the British anorak business.
funny thing is that conservationists like you, who are fighting to keep the line open now, would probably a hundred years ago be fighting to stop it being built in the first place. Oh, I have absolutely no doubt about the fact. But uh, the fact that it was built and is there, and is a great piece of architecture, uh, means I think we ought to make the best of it. We ought to use it. So it's, big, it's it. bigger than just a railway line, it's actually sort of part of historical heritage? I think so. It's a part of the evolution, certainly, of the landscape of the Yorkshire Dales and the, the Eden Valley. Somebody once said that the Settle to Carlisle line was nout but scenery, and this is certainly true after Appleby, when the hills retreat into a watchful distance and the line slides quietly through the Eden Valley, a land flowing with milk and yoghurt. After that back-breaking run up to the summit, it's a gentle jog to Carlisle, the border town where the Midland finally linked up with Scotland and that profitable line to Glasgow. Today the train turns right here, off to Newcastle, home to York, but I get off to find a train back to London. It'll be a good, fast electric train and they won't have had to spend hours loading it up with coal and water. You just switch it on. And off it goes. And this is the way the world is going. I know all this. I also know that it won't be half so grand or aristocratic or breathtaking as the train we've been on today. It won't even smell half as good. The next day, I'll have forgotten all about my electric ride to London. But once you've been over the top with the Duchess of Hamilton, the memory stays with you forever. <laughs>